there in YouTube land? Well, I have a lot to share this morning, so I don't want to delay too much. I want to get right into it this morning. Is that all right? So let's pray. Father, we thank you for this teaching, the redemptive gifts that you've given to the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for those with the spirit of exhortation that you have put this teaching upon their hearts to be a blessing to us today. Lord, I thank you as we go into this next gift. Holy Spirit, that you move through me, that you speak the things that need to be spoken, that your people can receive what it is that you have for them. I thank you for those with the redemptive gift of giving, that this would just resonate deep within them so they would identify who they are in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So as you just heard, I prayed, we're going into the next gift, the redemptive gift of giving. How many givers are here? As a Christian, we should all be givers. But there are certain people that have this qualification and this personality gift, the redemptive gift of a giver. And it, it stands above and beyond those of us that are called to give. The scripture is clear in Romans 12, 6 to 8. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teaches on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do so with simplicity. And we're going to stop right there. So God says, he who's a giveth, let him give. With simplicity. The word here in the Greek for giveth is metadidomi. Can you say metadidomi? Which means to give over. If your gift, if this is your gift, know that God has enabled you to function in it. Before the foundations of the world, he was able to see who would be the ones who would, quote, give it over. Giveth also means to share or to impart. Metodidomi is a combination of two Greek words, the first being here, didomai, or didomi, and this word means to give, but it also means to adventure. To the one who has this gift of giving, giving is like an adventure. There's an excitement in their giving. The Word of God tells us that giving is an adventure, so didomai also means to bring forth and to offer. It means to have power. Do you know that you need power to give? You need to be able to set all things aside to give it forth. You need power to give as well as power to receive. Amen? Didomai also means to yield. Yield to what? Yield to the call of God and yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Metodidomai contains the word meta, which means participation. The giver fully participates in his giving. He is fully involved in that adventure. So this means that the giver is able to separate himself from money and truly fully participate in his giving. The giver doesn't love the money. He doesn't prize it above other things, especially the things of God. He loves to give just as Jesus loved to give. Amen? He says, who gives, let him give in simplicity. Say simplicity. simplicity. The word here is heplates, and it means singleness, sincerity, without self-seeking. Therefore, he who gives does it with pure motives. You know, some people give because they want attention, and some people give because they expect something like a bribe. That's not in the life of a giver. He gives unto the Lord with a sincere heart. He is not seeking a return. I'm going to sow my seed so I get something back. My harvest is coming. That's never the motivation of those who are givers. By the way, those with this redemptive gift of giver, it's not just talking about giving in the tithes or the offerings. A giver is the one that will recognize a need in the body or outside and be the one to go, Psst, Come here. They don't let the left hand know what the right hand is ever doing. Amen? Not only that, but they're also givers of their time. 
I have a flat tire. Can you help me? I ain't got time for you. That's never a giver. Amen? Hallelujah. The giver always gives in abundance. He gives generously. And he gives freely. Gee, sounds just like the Holy Spirit. Amen? The giver is always led by the Holy Spirit in his giver, and he is never compulsive in it. He personally knows his God and knows God as Jehovah Jireh, but he also knows his God as Jehovah Rohi, which we're going to talk about next week. Abraham knew Jehovah Jireh, God as his provider, but we're also going to recognize Jehovah Rohi, the Lord is our shepherd. Amen? We'll get there next week. Are we ready? I'm, I'm done with the book for right now. So let's get into the other part of the teaching here. As we look at the redemptive gift of giving, again, we see some of the heroes in the faith in Scripture. The redemptive gift of giving perhaps is one of the most astounding of the givers. One of the most astounding of the givers in Scripture would be Abraham, his grandson Jacob, Job, and Matthew. Just a little note about Matthew. There's more concerning money in the Gospel of Matthew than the other Gospels combined. And the reason is Matthew had the redemptive gift of giver. And when Jesus spoke about money and when Jesus spoke about giving, he was right in tune with that. Out of all of the seven redemptive gifts, the giver is the most difficult to peg by behavioral characteristics. The diversity, the adaptability, and the flexibility of the giver are legendary, and so they don't fit easily into a nice, neat little category. While some of the other gifts can be identified with three or four phrases, the broad range of competence and personality characteristics of the redemptive giver somewhat defies characterization. So I'll share the following characteristics and realize that this is a much lighter touch than the other ones we talked about more generalizations than the detailed characteristics in the previous gifts. You ready? First and foremost, God's design for the redemptive gift of giver is to have a generational worldview. Can you say that? Generational worldview. And there are very few givers that don't fall into this package. By a generational worldview, we mean that the redemptive gift of giver is focused not entirely on their own generation, but they are intentionally trying to prepare the way for their family after them. That could be their natural family, that could be their church family, or that could be the body of Christ. Right? We see this in Abraham's life. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, it says this, talking about Abram. He wasn't Abraham yet. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. You're all turning to it? Genesis is the first book. So, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. This is put in the context of warfare. He had just engaged the various kings that he defeated, the king of Sodom and the surrounding confederation that you read about in Genesis 14. It was the first time that he ever ventured into warfare. He had made an enemy for himself, can anyone relate, with many other kingdoms that were defeated. In this context, God says, don't be afraid. I'm going to protect you politically. I'm going to protect you militarily. Everything's going to be fine. The reality is that was not, the reality is this, that it was not his primary concern because Abram immediately responded with this. Verse 2, Lord God, what will you give me? Seeking, I go childless, and the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. In other words, Abram here is a wealthy man. God promises peace. God promises him security. And yet all of these things that he had for himself were not gratifying. He was concerned about the fact that he didn't have children. He did not have posterity. He did have nobody yet to bless 
in the future. Abram was thinking about his generations to come. He had a generational worldview. You understand? So by contrast, you look at the story of Hezekiah. Chapter 39 of Isaiah, we read the prophet coming to Hezekiah with a firm rebuke. Verses 1 to 7. Hezekiah 39, 1 to 7. At that time, Merodach, Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and presents to Hezekiah. For he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Hezekiah was pleased with them and showed them the house of his treasures, the silver, the gold, the spices, the precious ointments, and all his armory. All that was found among his treasures. There was nothing in his house or in his dominion that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and said to him, What did these men say? And from where did they come from? So Hezekiah said, they came to me from a far country from Babylon. And he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, and they've seen that is all in my house. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Now understand that in another passage of scripture, God said that he was the greatest king in terms of his obedience and seeking God out of any kings. This is seen in 2 Kings, and this is important to note. 2 Kings 18, 5 to 7 says, Hezekiah trusted the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no other like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything, and he carefully obeyed all the commandments of the Lord. Interesting, the word of the Lord that came this morning that we need to obey. He remained faithful to the Lord in everything and carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord gave Moses. So the Lord was with him and Hezekiah was successful in everything he did. It's very interesting that God put Hezekiah even ahead of David and Solomon. He was the greatest in God's eyes. This is not something his family carved on his tombstone. This was God's evaluation. He was a very, very righteous man. A man that led one of the greatest restorations in Israel's history. And yet, he lacked a generational world view. Verse 5 of Isaiah 39, going back to Isaiah. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and what your fathers have accumulated unto this day will be carried to Babylon and nothing shall be left, says the Lord. And they shall take away some of your sons who will descend from you, whom you will beget, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord which you have spoken is good. For he said, at least there will be peace and truth or security, the NIV says, in my days, or in my life, or in my lifetime. Isn't this amazing? Isaiah, the prophet, just prophesied, says, they're going to come, they're going to take your kids, they're going to make them eunuchs, they're going to serve the false king of Babylon, and he says, well, at least my life will be okay. I'll have peace. Imagine if someone said they're going to take your children away. Would that be your response? (laughs) No. No. So here's a man, he lacks a generational worldview. Here's a man who was told by the prophet in 2 Kings 20 that he was going to die, and he turned his face to the wall, he wept, he pleaded with God, he said, I don't want to die, I'm not ready to die, I got things I still want to do in my lifetime. And his authority was so great, his passion was intense, his intercession was so effective that God sent the prophet back not only to allow you to live another 15 years, but you'll I'll even move the sun back in the sky to prove I'm going to do it. Right? This chapter goes on and says the same account that we just read in Isaiah, by the way. A man with this degree of authority and intercession, pay attention, authority and intercession, only had a vision for his own life. And the prophet came and said, your children, your grandchildren's descendants are all going to be in a horrible position in Babylon. And he shrugged and said, that's okay, because at least I'll die in peace. 
He was a good man. He was a wonderful man, a righteous man, a man who led Israel in revival. But he did not have a generational world view. Redemptive gift of givers, by and large, intuitively, are thinking family. They are thinking long term. They're doing things in their life to position their children and their grandchildren after them for success. Have you found yourself yet? This is one of the hallmarks, one of the core components of the spiritual DNA of the redemptive gift of giving. Let's look at some of the characteristics according to the book that I have here. We're going to look at eight of them. Is that okay? okay? Number one, the giver loves to give unto the Lord from his heart freely without restraint. He doesn't do anything out of habit. When he brings his offering somewhere, he doesn't care if it's at a crusade or while visiting another church. He knows he's not giving to man, but he's giving to the work of the Lord. Number two, the giver operates in God's wisdom in all financial matters. He knows how to hear from God, and he knows how God can cause him to increase financially so he will have money to continually give. Number three, he desires to give quietly and in secret. Jesus said that we are not to let the left hand know what the right hand is doing. The giver gives not to be known or seen, but because he's obedient to God and recognizes a need. The giver is quick to recognize needs in the ministry, whether they be financial or material. He recognizes needs that others might overlook. Number five, the giver loves to give to motivate others to give. Now I just mentioned that he likes to give quietly, and now I'm saying he likes to motivate others to give. Here's an example. A pastor may make mention of a special offering being taken for a special need. It is the giver who's the first one out of his seat and running to give. That action will motivate others to give, and the giver's adventurous, excited spirit will touch the hearts of others. Number six, he receives great joy in giving when his giving is an answer to prayer. It's a blessing to God to be used by him to answer another prayer. The giver's hearing the voice of God is directed to meet the need. What a blessing. Number seven, he desires to feel a part of the work that he gives to. A giver wants to feel a part because that is perfectly all right. As a member of the body of Christ, he is to be part of that body. And number eight, the giver is easily turned off by pressure appeals for finances. The giver is led by the Lord in his giving, and he is never pressured to do so. Find yourself? Good. Now, let's follow closely. After this, being this good man with a generational worldview, there's the spirit of nurturing. They have the desire to create a family environment, to have family there, and to have family comfortable with being in relationship with others. What are interesting paradoxes with the redemptive gift of giver is that they have an immense heart for evangelism. Find yourself? And yet, they don't like to be the fruit picker. Many times you'll see a giver providing the resources or the vehicle or the means for the word of God to go out. They have a concern for evangelism. They want the priest saved around them to hear. But they stop just short. It seems very difficult for the giver to actually do the final stage of fruit picking. They'll plant the seeds. They'll tell people about Jesus. When the person's ready, they stop. Interesting characteristic, isn't it? Why do you think that happens? I think God has someone else ready with another redemptive gift to do the picking. Redemptive gift of givers would be the ones distributing Bibles to co-workers and to friends and neighbors. And this is a person very good at identifying fruit that is getting ripe. And they will either encourage the person at that point to go to church or they will bring an evangelist from church to meet that person. They do all the hard work. They do all the sowing. But the giver really resists doing the picking. Another characteristic of the giver is they are very 
independent. Aha, have you found yourself yet? We talked last week about the candelabra, remember? The candelabra has seven candlesticks. There are three parts of gifts that work together very well represented on that candelabra. The prophet and the mercy are naturally drawn to each other. The ruler and the servant are wonderful pairing. And the exhorter and the teacher really need each other to draw from one another. That leaves the giver standing alone. And God did that intentionally. There are some of those that curse the independent spirit of the giver. And yet God designed that into them. God designed them not to be needy. God designed them not to look to other people for help. God designed them to have no welfare spirit within them. God designed them to be able to look at a problem, handle it, and find their own solution without being needy or dependent upon other people. Have you found yourself? Now a carnal, a carnal, carnal redemptive gift of giver, this could be a big problem. Independence means lack of submission. But in the spirit, being independent and still being submitted exists. Amen. Amen. <sighs> there are also individuals that cannot be hustled. Because God designed them to give, they have to accrue money before they can give. And God wants the giver to give in the right way and not to be manipulated. I just said before, when there's a pressure to give or an appeal, they get turned off. It is relatively impossible to hustle a giver. You can't manipulate them. You can't guilt trip them. You can't finesse them. They're going to give when they're ready to give. And when they're ready to give, that's when they give. All the tools that normally work for extracting money from any other gift are relatively ineffective with the redemptive gift of a giver. God made them independent on purpose. The redemptive gift of giver is also able to relate to a wide range of people, and women in particular. You know, I was saying with Nada, when you find the redemptive gift of a giver, you will always find the unredemptive gifts of the taker. She said, that wasn't nice. I said, I know, but it's true. That's why I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I will not make you a target if this is your gift. Because you'll have people lined up. Gimme, 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 my name is Jimmy. <laughs> so the giver is able to relate to a wide range of people. And women particularly who are givers have an extra sense, an intuitive sense, for that which is false in other people. When the giver is a wife, very protective of her husband and her husband's ministry, she senses when there are people coming in that have hidden motives. The redemptive giver very much resists manipulation of information, does not like to have stuff withheld from them, does not like to be surprised. And they can sense when there's an individual coming into her husband's life that has a hidden agenda, whether the agenda is good or bad, righteous or unrighteous, the giver is sensitive to manipulation of information in those hidden agendas. The giver also tends to be a very private person in their own life and are concerned about protecting the reputation of their spouses and the rest of their family. In terms of spiritual warfare, important, the giver is prone to delegate that. They're not opposed to spiritual warfare. They're not opposed to the principle. They just don't like to do it. The giver, the giver is not confrontational by nature. In a financial project, in a means of making money, the redemptive gift of giver does not usually do an assault on the circumstances. The giver does not usually look at the obstacles and knock them out of the way. Rather, 
The giver are very astute at finding the ways, finding opportunities, finding the unseen options, and can then assemble different components that other people have seen but not connected. So they have great insight. The giver is opportunistic in seizing the available moment rather than being confrontational and just knocking things out of the way. And therefore, they tend to delegate the warfare to anybody else that's willing to do it. In terms of money, one of the amazing things about the redemptive gift of giver is the way that money just seems to flow to them. They have a capacity to read the fine print in business deals and find the opportunities other people miss. There are issues of timing that are simply supernatural and their ability to find favor in the eyes of other people in terms of money, again, is a supernatural part of their, their DNA. Not something they've had to learn to do. Not something that they were taught. It's just something that drips off them. How many want to be a giver? I didn't say how many are. How many want to be a giver? Sure, money flows my way. I'll, I'll take giver any day. <laughs> Not because they so. Their personality. God has put the favor of God on them. It's not about their sowing and their giving. There was a lady, example here, there was a lady who had no capital at all, no resources, and she was a giver. Did not know she was a giver, but she had the desire to be in business. She looked around town. She found a small business that she felt she wanted to buy. She had no money to buy it. She went to talk to the owner. She visited with him on and off over the course of three or four months. She put no pressure on him. But because of the divine favor that is on the redemptive gift of giver, God put it in the owner's heart to sell her the business for nothing down and let her run the business and pay it off incrementally, even though she had no experience running the business had nothing to do with her sewing. This is a kind of supernatural thing that happens all the time in the life of a giver. They not only give well, but God provides the resources to come to them. And they do give well. They give very wisely. Other redemptive gifts give. Other redemptive gifts give generously. But the gift of giver will always give wisely. Usually the giver doesn't want to provide funds for a startup. They want to see that a ministry or a business is established. They want to see that the individual has credibility. They want to see that this is a valid investment. And there will be an eternal reward on their investment. So they don't like to provide startup capital. They prefer to invest in a ministry or a business that is already doing well. They also tend not to invest in the poor. Most of the time their attitude is the poor are poor because they mishandle their money. They weren't good stewards. If I give them more money, they're just going to mishandle the more money. So they reserve their giving to those that are wise in handling money. I'm not saying that's all of God's design. I'm just saying that's the pattern that exists. Another negative side. There tends to be a frugality with the family that can lead to some reaction in many cases. The family looks at the giver who is very generous on the outside in his giving and lives very, very, very economically and frugally at home. That could cause some problems if the wife doesn't understand the husband's the giver, if the husband doesn't understand the wife is giver. You give to everybody and you're buying no frills noodles. How many of you buy no frills noodles? Let's talk about some warning signs. Number one, because the giver is financially minded, some people may mistake you for being carnally minded since you discuss the need. That's not faith. Talk about the answer. They may appear that you are not exercising your faith. 
You speak of financial things, temporary things, but actually you are talking of the things of God's kingdom, which are not temporal. People may think that you have nothing but money on your mind. Some people are always quick to judge, and this comes because they are ignorant of the truth. If you recognize this gift in your brother and sister, I'm sure you will now have a different opinion. Second warning sign. Your attempts to encourage others to give may be mistaken as self-recognition. Giver, you need to know these things. People may mistake you as if you're trying to be recognized for your giving. And number three, your desire to give to the ministry or to the pastor may be misunderstood for an attempt to control the work or the person. Giver, continue to move in your gift as being led by the Spirit and God will not allow your generosity to be mistaken as anything less than what it truly is, your love and your obedience towards God. You ready? You got that? Let's move on. On the carnal side, there's a tendency for the redemptive gift of giver to see his own money as appointed security or to see the extended family as a point of security. It's not for yourself. God doesn't bless the giver for the sake of himself. There's a tendency for the giver to not learn from the past. They see each situation as unique. And even though they personally have stumbled and fall several times in the same place in the past from other people's perspective, they say no if it's not the same place this is just completely different situation. So on the outside, it looks like he's tripping over the same crack in the sidewalk. But it's with different people, and it's in a different location, so thus it's not the same in the mind of a giver. Okay? This creates a great deal of tension. Pay attention. A great deal of tension between the redemptive gift of profit and the redemptive gift of giver. Because the redemptive gift of profit, remember, can extrapolate from eternity past to eternity future. They see the patterns and they insist that the patterns are valid and they have application in this situation. And the redemptive gift of giver really resists when somebody confronts them over issues that are more than a week old. They don't like to see patterns. They see each situation unique. The redemptive gift of giver also hesitates to accept absolutes in circumstances and sometimes even in the word of God. They like to keep all options open as long as possible because of their immense creativity. So givers are very creative. In a carnal, immature giver, they can be very loose with God's absolutes because they like to keep their options open. One of the greatest pitfalls of the redemptive gift of giver is believing that they can, fin they can finesse God the same way they can finesse people. The ability of the giver to work with individuals to bring individuals into the appropriate alignment for them to be able to make money to persuade people to do things they wouldn't normally do in the business arena is remarkable. The things the giver's able to do and accomplish in terms of motivating people. But you cannot bring that same finesse to God's laws or principles. God's absolutes are absolute. God is not manipulated, and in the spiritual realm, what you sow, you reap. In dealing with people, the redemptive gift of giver is able to invest a nickel and get five hours worth of return, is able to get a disappropriate return on the effort he puts in. But in the spiritual realm, he's not able to manipulate God the same way. Amen? Can someone chase the crows away, please? <laughs> I don't know if you guys can hear the crows on YouTube, but there's like, they're all singing outside my door right now. They must be givers, or they must want something from the giver. Their names are Jimmy. <laughs> Thank you. 
One of the greatest strengths, however, for the redemptive gift of giver is the ability to withstand ideological tensions without bringing closure. This is a good thing. Again, in stark contrast to the redemptive gift of profit, the prophet likes to bring everything to closure. If we have a problem between two people, it's very simple. Somebody's right and somebody's wrong. Let's take this to court. Let's figure out who's right and who's wrong and bring closure. That's the prophet. The compulsion of the redemptive gift of profit has to drive things to a conclusion and determine what's right or wrong. This is part of the prophet's DNA. It is part of the way God made him. There's a deep conviction about right and wrong. And yet, the pragmatic, practical approach of the giver brings, it enables him to be a peacemaker. He is able to work with people that have extremely conflicting worldviews and theologies and not bring it to the point of closure. I'm going to give you an example. This is amazing when you see it at work in a church. You have a pastor with the redemptive gift of giving. The kind of contradiction, right, where the youth pastor holds an evangelical view, the senior pastor is a charismatic, and the pastor in between doesn't have much to do it either. And in most pastoral staff, that kind of theological differences would blow the team apart. And yet, the redemptive gift of giver has an incredible God-giving ability to function as a team maintaining the differences in tension without bringing them to a resolution. The fact of the matter is there really is no need to do that. If the team is working in unity and agreement, that makes that team the key to success, being able to work together and not pridefully say, my side is right, your side is wrong. And the giver is the one who ties it all together. There's another redemptive gift, not even the exhorter, that can maintain that much tension around a goal-oriented ministry without bringing it to closure. So these are some of the behavioral characteristics. Let's look at the spiritual dynamics below them about what God's purposes for the giver are. Again, we'll talk about the, about, again with the seven redemptive gifts to choose from, He could have chosen any of those redemptive gifts for Abraham, the father of the whole nation of Israel. The things that Abraham did and what he contributed to the nations flow from his gift. And God chose the gift of giving for Abraham as the father of the nation. So let's look at the fifth day of creation. Fifth gift, fifth day of creation. Genesis 1, 20 to 23. Are you ready? New King James. God said, let the waters abound with an abundance of living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the face of the firmament of heavens. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good and God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply Fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Did you get it? Is my page stuck? Nope. So the first thing that we have to recognize here is diversity. Say diversity. diversity. One of the reasons that is more difficult to determine the gift of the giver, is the diversity of things they're involved in. There seems to be no limit to the areas where they can be effective in their gifting. There seems to be no limit to the areas where they can make money, where they can exercise the different facets of their giving. And so they do not fall into a predictable job category. Also within the home, the redemptive gift of giver, you tend to see a lot of different interests and a lot of different projects. It is hugely, it is hugely unusual to find a giver with a single focus. Typically, they have their fingers in many pies. 
There are many different projects going on. There's lots of different activities. They are very diverse in their life, many different interests. But far more significant than that, it was the first day where God created life in the blood. We talked last time about the first generational gift, which was the gift of teaching, where there was life in the trees, life in the vegetation, but there's a new kind of life now, life in the blood. And so, life and health issues become central to the giver. There is a concern about the preservation of life. There's a concern about the quality of life. There's a focus on being prepared for old age. There's a need for safety. But most importantly, there's a spiritual authority to protect new birth. Say new birth. I think all of us have been in a church where a worthwhile program has been conceived. It's been birthed. And early on, in its early on in its existence, the first six or eight weeks of the new program, after that it begins to just fizzle out, it dies, it disintegrates, poof, it's gone. Right? This is a clear, blatant demonic attack. There's a particular package of demonic power that devours new birth. And it is the redemptive gift of giver as an intercessor that has the greatest authority to nurture, to protect, to guard the new programs, to guard the new birthings. So within a congregation here where something new is starting, example, we just started the new children's church. How many want to see it fizzle out and die? Those that have the redemptive gift of giver have the authority to see that come to fru full fruition, but not just full fruition, to go for generations. You have the spiritual authority and warfare to protect the children's church or any new ministry that we embark on in the not-so-distant future. Sound good? And all the givers went, hmm. And everyone else went, huh? <laughs> Got it? Amen. It is not necessary for the giver to protect it all the way through its entire life, but just during the early stages of birthing, of nurturing, and of the establishing of a new ministry. The redemptive giver has extraordinary authority. We also see in this passage about the creation, there is a generational anointing for the giver, meaning that the things the giver does that are good or bad are more apt to be carried out, to be multiplied in their physical and spiritual seed. Let every seed reprodu reproduce life after its own kind. As I said before, the sun, the moon, the stars, God created on the fourth day, and we still have those with us. It's the same sun, it's the same stars, it's the same moon. But all of the animals and all of the birds and all of the fish that God created on the fifth day have long since died. And we are now seeing the reproduction of 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 those birds and those animals today. Right? So this is the second generational gift. But more important than that is the fact that this is the day that God first spoke blessing. All the other gifts, the, the other days, he just said it was good. But this day, the fifth day, he spoke blessing. Verse 22. This is very significant. Wherever there's first fruit, that's significant. Verse 22, God blessed the birds and the fish and said, be fruitful, increase in number. So the waters in the seas and let the birds increase on the earth. When it says man was made in the image of God, it's referring to three things that God did during the first week. The first thing that he did during the first week was to create. The second thing he did on the sixth day was to create social order, where he established man and woman and perimeters to the garden and purposes and moral law and regulations, yada, yada, yada. And the last thing he did was to bless. This is what separates man 
from animals. We don't create by the way we make. Mankind is obsessive compulsive about making. We have research and development labs all across the country and day after day after day books, pieces of music, new gadgets and things and toys and events pour off the presses, the manufacturing plants of this world. We go to the beach, we build sand castles or we draw our names in the sand. We go to the forest and we have to carve our initials in the tree. We make, we leave an impact, we change, but we're not designed to just leave things alone. Mankind. We make far more than we need. The birds make nests in the air, but they only make basically what they need. We make and we make and we make and we make because that's in our genes. It's part of the image of God within us. The second thing we do is organize social structures. You put three people together in a room for two hours, and when you're done, you're going to have either a club, an army, a business, or a church. We organize social structures obsessively. We have things from the PTA all the way up to the New World Order. There's always pecking orders, rules, regulations, and objectives with goals and plans. Correct? That's how we live. But the third part of our heritage, one-third of what makes man different from animals, is the ability and the power to bless. Turn to your neighbor and say, bless. bless. And sadly, the body of Christ has largely abandoned this. I hear Christians running their mouths and cursing and putting things down more than they do lift things up. We're opinionated about everything. We think this is better than that. This one's always doing wrong. This is bad, but, but learn the art of blessing, please. The occultic world has taken up what the body of Christ gave up. And their effort that has invested in studying the power of cursing is frightening. Those who have worked in deliverance has discovered the most bizarre complex, sophisticated, technically detailed forms of cursing. And they are merely taking that human birthright and perverting it. Proverbs 18.21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will indulge in it and will eat the fruit and bear the consequences of their words. Scripture says life and death are in the tongue, not just death. And for every single thing that we have seen in the area of curses, there is the power to bless. In the body of Christ, if the body of Christ spent as much effort in studying the art of blessing as we have in our culture studying the art of making and the art of organizing social structures, imagine what our world would be like. There are three different kinds of blessing. The blessing giving to the giver the blessing given to the redemptive ruler, the blessing given to the redemptive gift of mercy. Three different kinds. We're going to talk about the givers today. But the beginning blessing, the first fruit blessing, the foundational level of blessing is the birthright of the redemptive gift of giver. Being a blesser. Turn to your neighbor and say, I want to bless. Now, a couple, now couple this together with the generational worldview and a generational anointing. And God has designed the redemptive gift of giving to give to the world far more than money. God has designated the redemptive gift of giving to release generational blessings into family lines, the authority to bless, the authority to bless generationally, the authority to be a life giver through the power of blessing. And this is the key component of the birthright of the giver. It is high time we prized it and brought it back to the church. Blessings. Think of generational blessings that flowed through Abraham. Because of what he did and because of the authority that he received from God and the blessing that he passed on to his son Isaac. The world is a different place 3,500 years later. 
because of the generational blessing accrued and dispensed by this man with the redemptive gift of giving, this is the heritage of the giver. People see the giver in terms of money, but it's not, but that's just a meager definition. That's just a very superficial thing. It is the generational blessings that are his birthright. Now let's move on to the compound names of Jehovah. It's the fifth compound name of Jehovah, Jehovah Rohi. And we find that in Psalms 23, the Lord my shepherd. As I commented for the redemptive gift of profit, we invoke the name Jehovah Jireh for financial material provision. And that's inappropriate because it is the domain of the giver. Right? We know that Abraham came up with the name Jehovah Jireh. He found the ram stuck by his horns. But more significantly is Jehovah Rohi. This is the psalm. You all know it. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. I shall not have any needs. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me besides the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me. In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It is here where we should go to invoke the name of God for financial, tangible, material provision. Notice the sequence, because the four things here in the package are hugely instructive about the growth sequence for the giver. He begins with a provision, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me besides quiet waters, he restores my soul. From a shepherd's point of view, this passage has not only provision, but it has safety. He leads me besides quiet waters. Want to learn about sheep? Sheep are very easily spooked, and they don't like to drink from turbulent streams. So there's security. There's peace. There's quietness in this pool of water that he brings his sheep to, to drink. And it says he makes them lie down in green pastures. Again, the ease of which sheep are frightened. And they're only going to lie down to chew the cud when they have a sense of safety and security. So we have these two themes. Again, there's provision, but there's safety. There's nurturing there. There's an environment in which the provision can be enjoyed. This is what God does first for the giver. God initiates. God primes the pump. He provides the provision and the safety and the security for the giver. Then he requires the giver to response. I'm sorry. He, he requires from the giver a response. And that response is to be holiness. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. As we go through the rest of the passage dealing with the giver, you will see the issue of holiness on more than one occasion. And this could be the downfall of the giver. Not that they are evil, but they are just casual about holiness, and yet God requires it. The third step then is relationship, and this is pivotal. Pivotal. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff comfort me. Again, we see another passage that relationship with God is the missing link, usually for the redemptive giver possessing his birthright. It seems to be a common thread, right? Wherever there's a lack of relationship with God, you'll never get the fullness of the benefits of the birthright of your gifting. The redemptive gift of giving was made to be independent. It was made not to be needy for other people, but God 
did not intend the giver to be independent of God. God did not intend the giver to go through life with his expertise, with his money, using his own money, his own expertise for his security, for his provision. God requires a relationship between the giver and his God. And so God will take the giver through the hard times. And in those hard times, the redemptive gift of giver will have to choose whether to look to himself for security or to look to his God for security. And God's desire is not to hurt the giver, but just to allow the threats of impending danger to cause the giver to turn to his God for security. Notice in Psalm 23, he's not hurt. He walks through the valley of the shadow of death, and he fears no evil. When you're with me, your rod and your staff comfort me. Notice those words. There is no warfare here. There is no assault. There's no attack. There's not even any harm. There's no damage done. It's all perceptual. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, because of the yearning for safety, the redemptive gift of giver can be excessively prone to see problems anywhere. And whether the problems are real or imaginary, God allows those to intrude into his life so that he can draw what? Material protection? No. So that he can have no fear and he can find comfort in the rod and staff in the presence of his Lord. It's relational. The redemptive giver must be able to find his security, his peace, his comfort in the face of threat through his relationship with God. Lacking that, everything else will collapse. But when he does find it, when there's a holiness, when there's the relationship with God, the payoff is immense. It is so immense, it lasts for two to three generations. You prepare a table for me. Where? In the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflow. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. How long? Forever. Generational blessings. Forever. Pursuing the man and passing on to the subsequent generations. So we have a sequence. Provision with safety. Holiness as a response. The Lord brings trauma into the individual's life to try to force the relationship with God. And if the person enters into relationship and makes God his point of safety, then God bestows an extravagant, extravagant anointing upon him. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, goodness and love or goodness and mercy. You prepare the table is provision. Right? The preparation of the table is provision, but it is the goodness and the love or the mercy that will follow. Think of this. What is the descriptive phrase? What is the title that Abraham has in Scripture? Is it the father of Israel? Is it the father of many nations? What is it? He was a friend of God. One of the greatest strengths of the redemptive gift of giver becomes his generational, his greatest battlefield, I'm sorry. The, the greatest strength becomes the greatest battlefield. That independent spirit that is good, fine, and righteous and blessed by God, the core part of his DNA, to turn it around to destroy him if he becomes independent of God. And if he does not need God and beyond needing, if he does not have a relationship with God. God designed the blessings to flow into the giver through that friendship relationship between the giver and his God. Amen. We're going to stop right there. So that was a mouthful, right? So I want to encourage you to go listen to the video again. It's going to be on YouTube. I will send the link out this afternoon, but YouTube will not publish it until later tonight. But if I send you the link today, you can see it. Okay? It's a lot. Has anyone recognized themselves as a giver? Don't raise your hand. 
How many haven't recognized yourself as a giver? Raise your hand. Oh, well, that's kind of the same thing, isn't it? We're going to pick up next week talking about the tabernacle and then the, the church and Revelation, and it really gets interesting. There's a lot of reading. Again, there's a lot of reading, not so much teaching in this teaching. I could use a cup of coffee and an iced tea. Anyway, let's pray. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you for those that you've called into this, into our body as well as the universal body of Christ with the redemptive gift of giving. We thank you, Lord, that those that are hearing this teaching today and hearing these words, Holy Spirit, you bring things to our remembrance and you can remind us of the instances of our personality that prove to us that, yes, we are redemptive givers. I thank you, Lord, for that anointing to begin to flow, that they would begin to draw closer to you and build a true relationship with you so we all can benefit from this redemptive gift. Lord, we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, see.